So uh, I'm going to be talking about Can Micro, and this is a, a project that is a finalist um, in the, the Crush It Challenge. All right, so as we, we just heard, um, conventional combination is um, quite inefficient, it's non-selective, and it really hasn't changed fundamentally in over 100 years. This is a, a picture of a uh, ball mill from the 1870s, and you can see that it, uh, it looks pretty familiar. So in the middle of the last century, microwave heating technology was developed from military radar research. And while the applications have been primarily food-based, uh, the potential for this to be used uh, in metallurgy was realized early on, and research has been conducted in this area for over 30 years now. So today, microwaves are widely applied in other industries at high power, high throughput, um, Lots of these units in food processing, but they've also been used in coal drying, for example. This is a coal drying unit shown here on the slide. We also have ore sorting being rolled out in a number of operations around the world. So what we're doing is we're combining these two um, established technologies, microwave treatment and ore sorting, to achieve um, what, we're, what we believe is unheard of energy savings. Um, our approach, uh, we're using multi-mode microwave technology. I'll talk a little bit about why that's different from what some others are doing. Um, this can be integrated seamlessly into existing operations. And as I said, um, the math is telling us that we can achieve some significant energy savings up to 70%. So what, what is the process? Well, we hit the ore hard and fast with high power microwaves. So above 100 kilowatts, right now we're targeting 150 to 200 kilowatts. We're looking at less than a second, you know, 0.1 second of exposure. And what happens is, because ores are composed of different minerals, these different minerals respond to microwaves differently. And so we get thermal expansion um, and, and, and fracture, stress and strain across grain boundaries. And this results in fracture across those grain boundaries. And if we're lucky, we also get fracture in the bulk. So you can see some pictures here from my research where we have fracture across grain boundary on the left and fracture in the bulk on the right. <coughs> now what's also cool um, is that it's typically the valuable minerals that heat. So we can use this initial treatment to generate a thermal signature. So rocks that contain valuable minerals will heat a little bit. Rocks that don't will not heat. So we can use this thermal signature to sort. So we're hitting the rocks with microwaves, we're pre-fracturing them, and then we're using that, um, the rocks that heat versus those that don't to actually sort the material. So we get weakened ore particles, we get mass rejection, we get a better liberated and higher grade feed to the concentrator, we have a coarser product size, and significantly reduced grinding energy as a result. So why are we different than what some other people are doing? Um, well, as I said, um, we're really focused on multi-mode uh, microwave technology. So multi-mode microwave cavities are built in multiples of half wavelengths. Um, so we can scale these things as big as we want to. Some other work that's been done has really focused on monomode technology. Monomode is great for establishing an area of very high intensity microwave field, but it's lim the cavity is limited to the size of the wavelength. So at 915 megahertz, which is the industrially approved frequency in North America, that means the cavity is limited to 30 centimeters, and that's limiting for throughput. So that's why we've chosen multi-mode microwave technology. We're looking at multiple ore types, so we're currently, and I'm gonna talk about this in the process of screening multiple ores, whereas previous work has primarily focused on copper. We're looking to treat large particle sizes. So another limiter of this multi-mode cavity, or the monomode cavity rather, if you have the 30 centimeter cavity, it's difficult to get big rocks through there. So we're saying multi-mode, bigger cavity, we can put bigger material through it. We're also looking at the effects on downstream processing. This is a big part of the Ken Micro project. We believe a lot of the benefits are going to be seen in flotation, in gravity recovery, in leaching. We're looking at using multiple sensors. So not just thermal, but can we use dielectric sorting? Can we use optical sorting? Can we also integrate, for example, XRF? Previously, this technology has just used thermal on its own. And we are combining the sorting, the microwave-assisted sorting and comminution. All work done previously has looked at these things in isolation. We're looking at how can we um, as, develop microwave treatment so that we can achieve both for maximum energy savings. Oh, this is odd. Um, okay, so how are we achieving these energy savings? 
Well, the first one is the reduced door competency, right? So we're getting cracking across grain boundaries, we're getting cracking in the, the bulk material, and so it's much easier to break that material when it goes to a sag mill or a cam um, or something of that nature, right? So right away we're achieving energy savings. The next thing is that because we're breaking across grain boundaries, we don't need to grind the heck out of the material. So we can achieve, for example, we've seen with the gold ore, that we can achieve the same degree of liberation with microwave treated material at 300 microns compared to untreated material at 100 microns. So if you only have to grind to 300 versus 100, that's huge energy savings because it's always in that fine fraction where your energy usage goes way up. The third thing is that we're rejecting mass in sorting. So right off the bat, we're grinding less material. So these three things combine. So reduced work index, increased PAD, and a reduction in tonnage to add up to significant energy savings. And so some calculations we've done based on gold, copper, and nickel ores from some work that Chris Pickles and I have done in the past. You know, for the nickel ore in particular, you see up to 70% energy saving. So it's, it's pretty astounding when you actually work through the math. So we have, uh, it's not just me, um, we have a team of, of um, academics and uh, companies um, from across Canada that are involved. Um, so myself and Chris Pickles from Queens are on the fundamental side. So what minerals are in the ore? How do they heat? How long do we need to heat them? Um, that kind of thing. Um, we've both been doing work on this for over 30 years ourselves. Um, we have Jay Ganazi from SRC, who is a sorting specialist, so they're going to be taking the lead on building and developing our, our sorting algorithm. We have Alex Ur from Corem. Um, he has been involved in some microwave scale-up activities in the past, but also is an expert in mineralogy, so he's a really um, great asset to our team. We have Boyd Davis from KPM. This is where we're building our pilot plant, so this is at Kingston Process Metallurgy. Um, we will also be doing a techno-economic assessment as part of this, right? So, so we're not just demonstrating the project at scale, but we're actually developing the business case behind it. When and where should this be used, or should it not be used? And then we have Andrew Gillis from Sepro Mineral Systems. So this is our um, commercialization partner. So how can we bring this technology to the market? And lastly, we have Jillian, who is our project manager from CMEC and is keeping us all on track. So we have a really great team from beginning to end, and that's what's going to make this project successful. So we are part of the Crush It Challenge, 800,000, 18 months to build this thing and prove it and report it. The timeline is rapid. So we are currently in phase one, bench scale assessment of ores and engineering of the microwave equipment. The next phase in the fall, we'll move to our high-powered microwave testing and sorter fabrication. Phase three, we're going to be integrating the microwave and the sorting unit, as well as doing the sorting and grinding test on that. And phase four is really looking at that down, those down key effects. So you know, what are the benefits that we can achieve in flotation, um, gravity separation, for example, for gold or for leaching operations? So you know, broadly, what are the impacts? Well, microwave technology in itself increases productivity and efficiency. Um, electricity can be transformed to microwaves with efficiencies of up to 80%. Then that energy is transferred directly to the material. So in a tumbling mill, you're, we're just it was talked about, right? So a lot of that energy is lost to heat, to noise. Microwaves go directly to, into the material and heat it from the inside out. Extremely efficient way to transfer energy. And that energy goes directly into breaking the material. Then we're also doing the sorting. So we're automatically increasing the metal throughput the mill. Then we're reducing energy savings. So for where that energy is coming from a fossil source, we're reducing CO2 emissions. We're also reducing tailings because we're sorting waste out before we grind it, and then we're not grinding it as fine. So it's much easier to manage that material. In flotation, we're increasing the liberation, we're reducing slimes production. You've seen this in my lab. Microwave treated material, we don't generate as many fines, and that has huge benefits in flotation in particular. We're also generating microcraft, so even where it's not breaking, our leaching material can get in and pull out the valuable minerals with much greater efficiency. On the economic side, because there are energy savings, because we're improving downstream processes, this technology has the potential to take um, deposits that are currently not economic and transform them into viable mining operations. And we can also reduce the cost of operating for existing operations. And we have this pan-Canadian team from Vancouver uh, to Toronto and Kingston. And so the benefits of this project are going to be seen throughout. And we are developing expertise in microwave 
uh, technology that we believe will be widespread in the mining industry in the future. And so we're going to have a lot of that expertise here in Canada. So huge benefits. So what are we doing with the project? Ultimately, we're building this microwave and sorting system. We're going to demonstrate it. We're doing the techno-economic analysis. We're going to be developing some operational guidelines for commercial design. We're going to be demonstrating our value proposition. Um, and we're going to be creating unique know-how within Canada. So some benefits are that we have a small footprint and we have a bolt-on option. So this is something you can plunk down in your existing operation. You can commission it alongside what you're already doing. If it's not working, you turn it off and you keep milling. We're not replacing another piece of equipment that's there. And it can be installed over your existing um, conveyor system. Um, as we said, it's scalable and we have the potential to transform non-viable projects into operating mines. We think we're going to see achieve you know, great energy reduction. We're, we're already showing that we're actually seeing some explosive uh, behavior with, with low loss material. Um, we're using this multi-mode technology, which is widely used in the food industry. It's scalable to thousands of tons per hour required by the mining industry. Um, this can be uh, installed in existing operations. Right now, we're screening ores. Um, we're looking for more ores. And we are cash strapped. We're using about half of our money for our 800000 to buy this, this microwave. So if you're interested in being involved, please let uh, Jillian or myself know. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Joseph. I guess it goes without saying you shouldn't try this at home in your kitchen. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else should. <laughs> uh, all right, we've got a few minutes for questions. I'm sure there, there are a lot. That was fascinating. Who, who's got a question? Yeah. So, what sort of size reductions are you expecting directly from the, the microwave? Well, that was a surprise. Yeah. So um, typically at low power, we expect to see the actual size reduction occurring in milling, but at lower energy input during milling. So to actually see the rocks breaking in the microwave, and you know when you take them out, you can actually see them sort of disintegrated there. That's something we, we haven't experienced. So I don't know to, to be determined, um, but I can envision actually. So those materials, they're already broken. We can screen them out. We don't. But, but there is some size reduction happening. That's what we're observing at high power. Just one question, quick question regarding the moisture content. Is yeah. there any effect, uh, moisture content has any effect on this performance? Yeah, yeah, there's kind of two sides to that coin. So too much water, you're going to be putting a lot of power into evaporating it. But actually, water is a very high loss material. So a little bit of water in your ore actually increases the permittivity and makes it heat better, right? And if you have a little bit of absorbed water in the material or hydroxyl, it actually causes the material to um, get that bulk cracking, right? Because the water vapor is trying to escape as you're hitting it with high power. So a little bit of water is actually good. Jim? I had a question. Uh, do you find that anything on the surface effects, when you talk about flotation, you didn't get uh, the over grinding or you didn't get as much fine production, but do you yeah. find that the, the microwave actually changes the surface uh, effects so the flotation is affected at all or is that not? Yeah, there's a, there's a few different things that happen. This is one of my research areas that I work on. So on the one side, you get um, better liberation of sulfides, for example, because the sulfides are really microwave responsive. And so if you have more sulfides on the surface, you're going to get better floatability. You do have to be a little bit concerned with oxidation. But at 0.1 second, for example, microwave uh, exposure time, you're not getting a lot of that, that oxidation. Um, so the effects that we're seeing right now are mostly on the, the sort of degree of liberation side of things. But also there are, um, there can be some mineralogy effects as well, where we can actually reduce the production of some of those slimes or change the nature of the slimes, depending how much we're heating it. But that's, that's not really what we're trying to do with, with can micro. It's mostly physical. So if you had, if you had uh, like a chunk of pyrite in there with uh, another uh, pyrite, yep. you notice any breaking along those? Uh, yeah, actually, boundaries? yeah. So pyrite is much more micro responsive than calcopyrite. Um, so the pyrite, pyrotite, some of the most microwave responsive minerals we have, even though those are silly, are sulfide gang, right? But they actually greatly contribute to fracture, and it's that pyrotite that is causing those nickel ores in particular to respond so well. We had another question from around here. Board. Um, we're going to find out. But what we've seen for gold in particular, if, especially if it has some um, sulfides, in it, 
that you get um, great um, fracture. So that gold ore I showed was a refractory gold ore. Um, and we are able to increase that liberation size and increase the leaching efficiency by a, a substantial margin. So we saw a 50% ener energy reduction for that particular ore. So we're actually targeting gold ores because we believe there's a lot of value there. We have time for one more question. Okay, thank you very much, Erin. Thank you.